when I went to college uh, from 76 to 1980, I was, I'm from California, so I, I uh, went to Azusa Pacific University. Uh, and while I was there, I did a number of jobs to survive. Uh, but one of the jobs that I did was my roommate, uh, Brent, uh, his dad owned the largest boat dealership in Los Angeles. And so uh, my junior year, he came to me and said, hey, you want to make some really good money selling boats? I'm like, I don't know anything about boats. And uh, so he knew I was really good at memorizing Greek vocabulary to infinity. So he's like, hey, if you can memorize Greek vo vocabulary, uh, you can uh, memorize all the specs of the boats. And so he, here's a whole bunch of books. You know, so he gave me magazines and books and said, we sell glass trons and cobalts and bellboys for the ocean. And you just memorize all these specs and you can just sell them even if you've never driven one before. So I did. It was, it was unbelievable. Uh, so I had a lot of fun as a young man uh, working at the dealership. It's called Marsh Air Marine. Uh, and we, we, I learned a lot about sales and, and uh, talking to different kinds of people. Uh, and I have a lot of experiences from there that I'm sure I'll be able to draw on for all the years until God calls me home. Things I learned uh, about myself, about my spirituality, about life. Uh, but one of the things that I learned uh, from working there was about sin. Uh, and I learned about it from uh, an opportunity that we had on, uh, on a given weekend because uh, the, the, the boss, Gail Fletcher, Brent's dad, and I, and I lived with them my junior year uh, one summer. They had a beautiful home, like a four-car garage. They had all the, the toys and things. Great godly, godly family from Missouri. God had blessed them greatly. But uh, they had a beautiful van. Remember when vans were the thing? When you bigger the van, the cooler the van, the better, you know. So they had a, they had a van for the dealership, and it was all tricked out, airbrushed, because we had a guy that did all of our airbrush work for the, for the boats and everything, and he pinstriped it and put the logos and everything on the van. And we, could, we as young men could take this van any time that we wanted to and pick any boat off the several acre lot to Lake Havasu. Talk about the perfect way to go to college. And so, you know, uh, so we would pick boats. And we're like, I, we, we want to try that one out. And so we'd go pick boats, and we'd hook it up to the beautiful van, and we'd go cruise on I-10 to Lake Havasu. Uh, and the, the boss had a double-wide uh, mobile home there. And uh, we would just, it was right by the lake. And it was awesome. Do you think that we had a problem getting guys from school to go with us? <laughs> You know, it's like, hey, can we come the next time you guys go? And so we took, uh, I think, half of Azusa Pacific University went with us on these weekends. We were always inviting people. One day, Brent came to me and he said, hey, uh, I want to do something different. He said, I went to um, high school, you know, here in L.A. And he said, I, wanna, I have a lot of friends that don't know Christ. So I want to make this, this trip, you know, uh, all my non-Christian buddies from school. He said, are you okay with that? I'm like, well, Jesus hung out with non-Christians, Right. So, yeah, sure, it's, be, it's fine with me. And he said, well, one of my friends is bringing his girlfriend, too. Is, is that okay? I'm like, well, I mean, you know, I, you know it's, this is another kind of sin. We can hang around these guys all weekend. So we did. I just think they, they brought all the Budweiser that was in the state of California with them. Uh, I didn't drink, didn't, never liked drinking. I had a lot of friends that, that drank and had tragedies that happened to them. I learned early on, don't do that. Uh, but they brought all the beer, and I don't drink, and there, there we were. And so that... That's all they did all weekend. I mean, they drank to infinity. I'm, I'm analyzing them. Like, how much can you possibly drink in a human body? Uh, and they're also driving the boat. <laughs> Not a smart thing. And uh, bud after bud after bud, and their long hair's flying. This one I had here, and it was long. And I mean, we're cruising along, and the, the boat was almost a flat bottom boat. I think it was a 454 Chevy uh, with a Panther jet engine. It would rock. 400 big chrome pipes all over the back, giant rooster tail. It was fun, but they were drinking all day. So after the first day of, of, of water skiing and having a great time, they decided they wanted to take the boat up the river uh, and go as close to the bottom of uh, Hoover Dam that we could get to. I think that was the dam at the time. It's still there. I think it's still there. And so we were cruising. It was getting kind of dark. It was getting dusk. Mount mountains were starting to turn purple. and It was getting dark, but they thought we could make it. We pretty soon we realized this is too far of a drive in the boat to actually get there. So we should probably turn around. I'm like, praise God, we're going back and get, get on dry land. Well, as we're going back, we're flying along, and they're drinking as we're flying along. And the, Larry, the guy driving, he sees like a little tributary off to the side. He's like, wow, that looks cool. Let's go down that river. And I'm like, hey, hey. So Brent said, hey, hey, got to be careful, man, because there's sandbars down these rivers. We can't see them. You might hit one. That'd be bad. Um, that did not stop the driver. So there we went down this little tributary. Uh, we didn't go down it very far until we hit a sandbar. Have you, have you ever hit a sandbar like in a flat-bottom boat? You ever done this? You stop instantly. <laughs> it's like a giant hand came out of the river, grabbed our boat, and just stopped us. Now, they were all drunk, so they flew around like rag dolls, 
And I'm, you know, I'm the only one not drinking. And there I am, I was like, we're going to die. Um, so there we were. We're stuck on the sandbar. I'll get to my sermon in just a minute. We're, we're stuck on the sandbar. It's got everything to do with my sermon, as you're going to see. We're stuck on the sandbar. And remember when there weren't cell phones? Yeah. You remember, like, like, what did you do if there was an emergency? Panic. You panicked. It's like, it's over. You can't bring a helicopter. You can't call the sheriff. There we were in the middle of nowhere on a side little river, stuck on a sandbar. It looked like we were in the water, but we weren't. You had a, like an inch of water. And there we were. And like, hey, man, what are we going to do? So after they quit laughing and everything, and I'm like, oh, you guys are crazy. Uh, Brent said, hey, we got to get out of the boat. And like, what are we going to get out of the boat for? We get the weight out of the boat, and then we need to jump on the sandbar. And since we we're all like weightlifters, we need to get in a position on the boat and then do our job to pick the boat up. Did you ever do lame things in college? <laughs> yeah, so we all jump out. You know, it helped the boat float a, more, a little more because it, it had a jet engine, you know, or jet uh, propulsion. And so it's like we got to get more water into the Panther jet, so got to jump out. So we jumped out. Have you ever jumped onto a submerged sandbar and tried to gain footing? It's like the more you dug your feet in, the deeper you sunk. And I'm like, this is, this is like sin. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? I mean, do you see the correlation? Or I lost you. Yeah, there we are. We're stuck in this boat, and we jump out, and we're trying to dig in to pick the boat up. It weighed like 60 tons. I mean, it just, it's just part of the sandbar. And, and Larry's flooring the boat while we're trying to pick it up with the wave action. We eventually, after much time, shimmied it off of there. Obviously, I'm here today. We, we lived. <laughs> but we eventually got the boat. I mean, you can imagine trying to propel a boat off of that. We eventually got it off enough to where we got into the water and were able to turn around and go home and to safety. So on Monday at school, we had an awesome story to tell. That guys were embellishing left and right, you know, what happened, etc. But I've never forgot about it because it is a story of life, is it not? You ever done something that you know you should not do? I mean, don't go down that river, and you did it anyway. And somebody like your mom or your dad's telling you, look, son, if you go that way, this can potentially happen to you. Did you ever blow your parents off, and you did it anyway? I've been there. And then you up stuck on a sandbar. We're going to call, for sake of theological purposes, we're going to call the sandbar sin. All right, you with me? It's the sandbar of sin. You, one person got it. Thank you. Praise God for you. It's called the what? Sandbar of sin. Have you ever been on it? Thank you. This is a confessional booth. Yes. Okay. And you've been on one. So like what happens when you get on it? When you get on it, one sin becomes another sin. And then it becomes another sin. And it's a snowball. What's it? You can't mix metaphors, but it's, it's kind of a, it's okay, I forgive you. It, but it is like a snowball. It, but it's like a, it's like a quagmire, or a, we could call it maybe quicksand. Quicksand, quicksand even works better. Yeah, the more you struggle, the deeper you go, right? And so there you are in this thing. And Paul says, this is exactly what I'm talking about in Romans 1. I'm talking about the power of the gospel to save sinners stuck on the what? Sand. Sandbar of sin. How do you get off that sandbar? Well, Paul says in Romans 1 16, it's the gospel of Christ frees you from that. But, but as he's been talking in this chapter, by way of review, verse 18, he says that the wrath of God is revealed against people who reject the fact that God, that God exists. And when they reject the, as we talked about the cosmological argument for God, as they reject that outright, then they, they replace that with philosophical systems so they don't have to think about God. And if they don't like philosophy, well, they devolve into other things. And Paul says, and as, just by way of review, he said, if you reject God and you devise things to keep yourself from God, you don't want God on the throne, you want your philosophy on the throne. If that doesn't work, then you're a sexual being, so you tap into your sexual drives and you put your perversity up here and you call it purity. That's what he says, that's what he says we do. We're going to worship something, and it's going to be like one of those two things. False philosophical systems, which lead to false religions, or we pervert our sexuality that God gave us as a holy gift, and we pervert that, and we call it purity. That's what he says happens. The rejection of divine revelation is costly. By way of review, Paul says it does two things. Number one, he's going to say in this passage that if you, if you uh, reject God outright, it leads to what he calls, as reviewing, sexual dishonor. Our, our culture says it's honor. Paul says, no, it's dishonor. That God sees your actions as dishonorable, no matter what you say about them. Then he says it also leads to delusion, that you can take your, your, your perversions, be what they may, that you want to call purity, and you can get to the point where you're so deluded about them that, that you can't see that they're wrong. 
You can't see they're abnormal. In fact, you'll pass laws to persecute anybody who says likewise. Dishonor. Delusion. Delusion to the point, Paul says, as we talked about last week, we're still reviewing, that a man who's designed to have a lifelong relationship with a woman in the confines of marriage, as God designed things, that a person can take their perversion to the level of saying, no, a man should be with a man, that's okay. Or a woman should be with a woman, that's okay. And Paul says, that's the ultimate form of taking God off the throne and putting yourself on the throne, no matter what you say. It's sinful. It's abnormal. And you're calling it normal. And Paul says it leads to costly activity. Now, our culture doesn't say this at all. What do they say? It is my right. It is my choice. And Paul says, you be very careful with your free will what you do with it. God designed you one way to go against the design is to go into that which is illogical, is to go to sin, and it leads to delusion where you think that's okay. Paul says it also leads to a third thing that we close with today. It leads to degradation. Degradation. You're degraded. You're not elevated. Degradation. It goes downhill. Never goes uphill. Sin always devolves. It never evolves. It always goes downhill, which is like uh, what the good sister said. It's like a snowball. It starts out here, and then it became this huge gnarly thing. That's why it's like quicksand. You get in it, and it, well, we started here, and then it went to this. One thing leads to another thing. Paul's going to call this list a vice list. It's a vice list. Now, our culture, how often do you hear sermons on vice? Imagine if I put this out on the billboard. We're talking this Sunday about vice. Oh, yeah, they're flooding to talk about vice. Does our culture even talk about vice anymore? No. I mean, I have a friend out in California because I was the sheriff chaplain for 1,300 officers. He's a vice officer. He's a cu- undercover. That's what he does. I'm like, anymore, like, what do you do? Because what's vice? Because everything that used to be vice, well, it's getting more narrow as to what vice is because things that we used to call criminal behavior is not. Perversions are not perverted anymore. So Paul says, I'm gonna, I want to list 21 things that people devolve into when they take God off the throne of their life. And this would be a really long sermon. Since this is the third service, we can go as long as we want, right? Praise God. Um, there's 21 things in this vice list. Do not think that they are uh, exhaustive because sinners can be very creative with the kinds of sins that they get into. And not everybody's guilty of, uh, that doesn't walk with God with every vice thing that's listed here. But the point's going to be when you get to the end of this chapter, Paul's going to say, if perversion is your way of life, well, that is, that's not the only kind of vice that you can get into. It leads to all other kinds of vices. And no one in said culture can escape the vice activity that he will talk about because we are all born sinners. It just comes natural. So what is that kind of activity? And by the way, as we look at this, uh, it is, it is this, the stain of sin. Do not get lost in the words that we're going to cover. He's going to cover 21 words. Uh, don't get lost in the words. Get lost in the, the fact that Jesus is the, is the answer to the stain. That's where we're going. He's the answer to the fact that you're stuck on the sandbar of sin. He's, he's your solution. So let's look at the, the passage at what Paul has to say. He says in verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, he's going to give them a depraved mind. Well, let's just stop right there. The, the very first word is and. It's a coordinating conjunction, chi in Greek, and it connects what he's saying here with what he just said. What did he just say? Were you here last week? What did he just say? If you take the sexual design of your body and use it against the design that God proposed, it is abnormal. It is sin. It is not optimal behavior. Yes, you can do it. People do it all the time. They've done it in my family, but it is not optimal. It's not how God designed it. It's sin. It's a deviation. He said, said, and just as they did this, it connects, it's connecting clause. He says, just as, which in Greek is a kathos is the word, uh, you have uh, lexical options of how to define kathos, just as in English is how it's translated. It it is a, a conjunction that means the reason for said activity or the reason why I just said what I said about lesbianism and homosexuality. What does he say is the origin of it. He tells you here, and this is totally anti-culture. But it's, it's what Paul says by way of inspiration. What does he say? They did not see fit to what? Acknowledge, acknowledge God. Why not? Well, because if I acknowledge God, then what comes with acknowledging God? Obeying God. What did God say? Well, I don't like some of the things that God says. Because he's telling me live this way, and I'm kind of feeling like my desire is going this way. So he says they don't see fit to acknowledge God any longer. This is interesting. The word here uh, to acknowledge God, acknowledge, uh, is uh, dokimadso. Dokimadso means to test something, to test something. 
Aren't you glad that when you go into surgery, the doctor, you're talking to him, he's, you're talking to him, hey, doctor, I'm so glad you're doing my surgery, and, um, and he tells you, hey, this, hey, this is my first one of these. <laughs> Are you going in? <laughs> I mean, I always think about this. When I was going to sur cancer surgery a couple of years ago, and they were, you know, working on my neck for a couple of hours, and I'm like, this is not your first one, right? Yeah, because you've had lots of tests in figuring out how to do this, right? So you want to test things to make sure that they're going to work. And he says, when it comes to God, the person who rejects God, and they're very crafty because they can say that they, well, I am spiritual and I know God. And when they say that kind of stuff, but they still hold their sin that's anti-God, and anti, anti how he created things. Then they get creative in how they rationalize their behavior. They interpret biblical text in ways not designed to interpret them. But anyway, back to my sermon. They, they test God. That's what the word means. It means to test something. So they test God. Now, my last church was near San Francisco for 20 years. I've heard all of the tests. I'll just summarize some of them for you. Well, are God's views of sexuality as fluid as ours are? Or are they fixed and restrictive? Because if they're fixed and restrictive, pff, we don't want those. Because that's not loving. That's not God. He's got to be fluid by definition. Because if he's not fluid, I mean, we're fluid. So we'll be able to choose what we want to. So he doesn't pass our test. So we don't want that God. Here's another test. Is God accepting in any, of any and all forms of sexuality as we are in our broad-mindedness? Or is he narrow and closed-minded? Well, because if he's narrow and closed-minded, then we don't want him. We want what we want. See the test? Does God lovingly confirm all sexual and gender choices as we do? Or is he one who condemns and restricts certain kinds of choices? I don't know. From what I read from the Bible, he's one who restricts. Why? I designed you this way. Anything contrary to that is a perversion. But that's what they say. So they find God is lacking in their arrogance, and they assume the fact that he's lacking. So therefore, they don't respond to him, and they choose their own sexuality as their God, and they serve it like they would serve a God. They found God lacking. How does God respond to those who test him? By the way, would you want to test God? I mean, who would have the audacity to stand before God and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stood, hey, God, I tested you out on this whole thing over here, and I found you were sadly lacking. I would not want to be that person. How does, what does God do? Have you ever heard of the term lex talionis? What? Lex talionis is what? It's kind of the laws of what? Yeah, the kind of law of the claw. Or in our vernacular, like what goes around? Oh, yeah, you know that one. Yeah. That what goes, you know this, what goes around comes around. If you re sow this, you reap this, right, by definition. So he's going to say, how does God respond to those who take God off the throne, won't worship him, will worship their own perversions, be what they may? How does God respond? Well, he tells you, God gave them over to a what? Depraved, Depraved mind. What's the result? Notice the cause effect. What's the, what's the result? To do those things which are not what? Proper. Proper. Whatever their perversion is, God says, it's not proper. How did you get to the point like, that you started doing that? How did you, like one of my friends in high school was a male prostitute. His name was Steve. We were friends. We went camping together as friends. Uh, us. A couple of us together. I mean, how'd Steve get there? We had lots of conversations how he got there. Was what Steve was doing when we were 18 years old proper? No way. He made a lot of money doing it. It was not proper. How'd he get there? He had a depraved mind. Now, what I find interesting is the word deprave is the same word, dokimatso, to test. But if you take the first letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha, and you wet it to any word, you negate the word. So you take the word to test, dokimatso, you put an alpha on the front of it, a, a dokimatso, you just negated it. It means there is no test. God says, you want to test me? I will take you and make you as a person who has no test about you, whatever. You flunk. It means God gives you over to a mind that does not have the ability to understand right and wrong, morally speaking. Man, have you ever ironed for your wife, your lovely wife? Have you ever ironed for her? Have you learned how not to iron? Have you learned? I, I have. I've been married 38 years. I've totally figured this out, but I've, I've ruined a few garments, okay? Because there's a meter. Now, now every guy looks at a meter on, a, on a, like a Rowenta iron and goes, oh, there's 10. Everything's on 10. Click. <laughs> have you done this? And then what happens? You're sitting there ironing. Everything's on 10. Ha ha. And you start ironing. And you just touch your wife's silk whatever. Just touch it. What happens? It, it's instantly gone. There's no redo. 
You just call her on the cell phone, hey, babe, I'm down in the basement. It's over for me and your blouse, you know. <laughs> Beep, it's gone. You know, and you, you learn that I, I can't do everything on 10. See, because you just seared it, right? See, this is a depraved mind. What is it? It's seared. It's fried by sinful activity. And Paul says, God gave you over to that. You want to pursue sin? God gives you that conscience that cannot tell truth for error, that you will call abnormal normal. You will call perversion, well, purity. You will call vice virtue and talk to those people, as I used to try to talk to Steve. And it's like, I might as well be talking to the podium. It's unbelievable. Well, this is what I desire. This is what I like to do. I enjoy what I do. I've heard all the arguments. It's depravity. It's depravity. What does depravity do to a person? Well, it causes them to surround themselves with other people who are depraved, who can uh, support them in their depravity so they don't think it's depravity. Nothing put, pulls sinners together than a given kind of sin. And they all get together to kind of collude with each other to make everybody feel great so they silence the conscience. Depravity. Paul says uh, it, it's what comes from any kind of perversion when you reject God. Now, he's going to get into the heart of what he wants to talk about. So come with me. It's going to be like a roller coaster ride. Are you ready? Are you ready? ready. He's going to go through a whole bunch of Greek words, okay? We'll talk about them. So what else happens be besides sexual perversion? Well, remember when you get onto that sandbar of sin, it goes from one sin to another sin to another sin, etc. So he goes, these people are filled with all unrighteousness. They, they call their activity righteous. But it's really unrighteousness, it's wickedness, it's greed, it's evil, it's full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and their gossips. All this stuff just kind of all kind of flows from one to the other. Remember, you're in the quagmire of sin. Now, he says they are being filled. Past tense? Is it, it's not past tense, right? Is it future tense? It's like a present tense, but it's, in Greek, it's not a present tense. It's a perfect tense. And when you read this in Greek, which I was reading this week and read it, it's like, oh, perfect tense. Very unusual to use a perfect tense. So you must stop and ask yourself, why is it in the perfect tense? Perfect tense in Greek is intensive. It's not used much. So when you see it, it's intensive because it's pointing to an act in the present that abides unabated into the future. What's that mean? That if a person takes God off the throne of their life, accepts all of their false systems as belief as, as God, accepts their false sexuality as God, uh, they will fill themselves up with all the 21 things that he lists. Maybe not each one of them, but they'll tap into them, like unrighteousness. What does it mean to be unrighteous? Remember I told you you took the, the alpha and wedded it to any word. What's it do to it? Negate. Negates it. Here he takes the word righteous, and he, he takes the alpha and puts it onto righteous and makes it no righteous, no righteousness. What does it mean to have no righteousness about you whatsoever? You could care less about laws, rules, and regulations because everything about you is unrighteous. What's our culture in love with? That. They don't want laws, rules, and regulations. They want to make their own laws, rules, and regulations. Unrighteous behavior. That leads to what is also called wickedness. He said they, they devolve into wickedness. Now, in some of your translations, because I know the kind of church you are, you're going to count all these words, and someone's going to say, my, my Bible has more words than yours does, Marty. Now, you're probably right. Because there's a textual problem when it comes to this part of the scripture. Because he, he says unrighteousness. In some translations, he says sexual sin, which is uh, pornia, sexual sin, be what it may. Uh, there's not enough uh, textual evidence to support that reading. It's not the most ancient reading. What, the, so what is the uh, given reading here is uh, not pornia, but poneria. Do they sound similar? Yeah, yeah. pornia from which we get pornography, sexual sin. And uh, ponaria is totally different. That's wickedness. So what would happen in a scribal school? You're sitting there with a, a, a parchment and a pen, and there's a lector reading, and he's reading this, and you lean over to Yehuda, and you say, hey, did, did, uh, as he was reading, did he say, did he, did he say pornia or ponaria? I, I don't know. I just put both of them down. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It makes sense, doesn't it? I'm, just, I'm putting two. Ponaria, pornia, it doesn't matter. Does it change doctrine? No, because does man commit sexual sin? Absolutely. But there's not enough uh, ancient biblical text, uh, textual evidence to support that reading. But I could accept it. But I'm going with uh, ponaria. What's that? It's wickedness. It's the, it's the guy, and I, with my dad being a federal agent, I grew up like this. But it's the, it's the drug dealer selling the opioids to young people who it kills them. What is that guy? He's wicked. 
He's a wicked, evil man. He's unrighteous to the core. That's what it is. And it's also tied in with the next word, greed. Greed. Pleonexia. Greed. This is a predatory greed. This is you live for this. What is greed? Well, I've, I've got to have more of whatever it is that I have. Whatever it is. Whether I'm a crank addict, whatever it is. I've got to have the next thing. Have you ever played a slot machine? And that's very interesting to ask this question in church because <laughs> there were two other services before you and there's a couple online. But you ever played a slot machine? I mean, just confess. Two people. I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, I lived near Lake Tahoe. I've been, I've been to Harvey's. I've been to Harris for years. When I was a kid, when I wasn't a Christian, I used to give my mom my little packs of two uh, two, uh, nickels, $2 of nickels, and tell her to go. Remember when the machines, were, they weren't electric, they were manual? And I would tell her, Mom, just sit right here. Here's my $2. Go make a fortune. She never came back with my money. <laughs> it's pleonexia. It's greed. Like, what happens with the machine? You put in your child's piggy bank, and guess what? It takes the piggy bank, doesn't it? Is this what happened to you? And if you increase your odds, you put in five at a time, what happens? It still takes your money. <laughs> See, it's pleonexia. It's greed. When Nathan uh, turned, uh, what was he, 18 or 21? I forget what it was. But he, we lived near a casino. He wanted to go. Been thinking about it all his life. I'm like, okay. So me and my, my dad and I, we took him. And we gave him $20 and said, here, there's a machine. Enjoy. Here's $20 and quarters. Came back in a couple minutes. How's it going? It took all my money. It took all my money. Do you want to play more? No. He's never played again. But what's greed say? Uh, I got to come back there. Because I know a businessman in California who had a, a wonderful restaurant. I used to go to it all the time. It's called the Islander. Uh, and he got into gambling. And uh, they would come pick him up in limos to take him to Tahoe to gamble, etc. Because he played so much. And eventually they took his entire business. It's not even there anymore. He lost everything because of pleonexia, greed. It comes with the getting on the sandbar. So does evil, kakia. Evil is kakia. Kakia in Greek means to be absolutely vicious. I hear it all the time, and it's a sad thing to listen to. You, you, you're married. Things are going great. You hit a rough spot. You hit a couple rough spots. You get divorced. The husband, you know, uh, you know, he, he, go, he marries the young thing and you're left with the kids and trying to function. And then you got this court thing set up to where you're supposed to, you know, share the children. But then whoever it was that he married is not a really nice lady. She's kakia, vicious. You can't even make seeing the kids a normal thing. You see what I mean? It's kakia. It's a, you're on the sandbar of sin. Envy. Envy. What is Envy. What is envy? You got something? I wish I had it. What do you mean they made you salesman of the year? I worked harder than you. I traveled more miles than you. I, I made more phone calls than you. But, but you pat the person on the back. Hey, Larry, fantastic. That's awesome for you. What's the shadow saying? If your shadow could speak. Loser. <laughs> Loser. You're envious. Envious. He says that also when you get into these kinds of modes, it gets down to where you feel murderous. Remember what Jesus said about murder? Because you will say, hey, I wouldn't murder anybody. What did Jesus say about murder? If you hate somebody, you committed it. That's Jesus' level of murder. But he says when people get to the point where they reject God and put themselves on the throne, that it becomes a heart issue, that they could kill other people, not even think anything about it, because the conscience is seared. The young man, I will not mention his name, that killed all those high school students in Florida, is the problem the weapon. Problem is not the weapon. What's the problem? The heart of the young man. It's full of evil, wickedness, envy, etc., murder. You could take away all the weapons on the entire planet, and if you still have sinners here, guess what? They will think of things to do that are evil, evil, murderous. Then it leads, Paul says, also leads to strife. Strife. This is the person that shows up to your uh, family gathering that you're like, are they coming? Because what happens when uncle whoever shows up? Every time he shows up, it's complicated. You have those people in your family? Uh, I've seen them in church too. They move around from church to church. They think it's their spiritual gift to create strife. That's just, it's what I do. And I, <laughs> I've met them. <laughs> One of the guys that caused me the most woe as a pastor. Terrible individual. Uh, he eventually left after hounding me for years. Mean, mean-spirited man. And he went to a friend of mine, another pastor, 
that I, I'd gone to Dallas Seminary with. We went to lunch one day, uh, and I was just talking to my friend, hey, how's your ministry? It's going fantastic. You know, it, facing any issues? Yeah, just one. <laughs> he, he, I go, what is it? He goes, it's, it's, a, it's a person. Really? And I go, like, what's he doing? So he told me what he's doing. I said, he's about 5'7". Yeah. <laughs> Does he have brown hair? Uh-huh. Yeah, he weighs about 145. Yeah. I'll pray for you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> the guy was strife city. Strife. It doesn't come from God. Once you take God off the throne, you just create strife to smoke clouds to make yourself look better. Leads to deceit, hiding behind what you really are all about. Leads to malice. Malice is, uh, is, is, is to put a negative, the Greek word means to put a, neg- a negative angle on everything that you hear. This is a person who can't hear good news. They're so excited about making bad news. Gossips is what these people become. I don't know if you've ever heard of an onomatopoetic word. Have you? It, you know, like clank, bang, click. Those are onomatopoetic words. This is one of those. The word gossip in, in Greek, I'll, I'll say it for you and you'll see what I mean. Sphitheristas, sphitheristas, sphitheristas. Kind of sounds like what? Like a gossip. What's a gossip? Do they, 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 what are those girls talking about? Pfft, I don't know. You know, <laughs> the, the most difficult thing to guard yourself against is a gossip, is it not? You cannot control them. Is it what I had to learn as a young pastor? I used to go around and try to put out the fires that gossips in the church would start that were mean. Stuff. I mean, I started keeping a list of all the 19 mean things they said. I stopped at 19. They were mean spirited people. And they were at, where were they? They were at church, whispering behind the backs. I would go to people. Who told you that? Well, I, as a Christian, I cannot tell you and break a confidence. <laughs> Are you serious? Have you ever considered the evidence is not true, what that being paired spirit of person said, etc.? And then when I would finally get them to tell me who it was, then they would leave the church. Gossip's a terrible thing. Can't defend yourself from them. I finally got to the point where I just realized God is my defense. Amen. I don't have to fear the gossip. God's my defense. Winston Churchill was sitting in a meeting at, toward the end of his career, uh, and uh, he was sitting there. Uh, and he had faced much opposition in his lifetime, and he heard the following conversation behind him from two men. Uh, that's Winston Churchill. You know, I heard, they, I heard he's getting senile. And, and, and they also say, from what I've heard, that he should step aside and lead the running to the country to somebody that's more capable and dynamic. After the service, he got up and walked back to the two men who were gossiping behind his back, and he said to them this, quote, uh, gentlemen, they also say that Winston Churchill's deaf. just saying see it's a gossip you can't protect yourself from them and there they are but like a backbiter is the kind of person who's saying it right to your face slandering you in front of other people to put you down stuff that's not true Paul says I've seen it they they become insolent the word is hubris over the top arrogance arrogance devolves into being boastful Inventors of evil. One of my friends is a developer in California, and he told me he, when he was building this shopping mall, they put in thousands and thousands of dollars of, uh, of uh, plants and all around the perimeter of the shopping mall, and they put in security cameras on, on the light poles that, that rotated on a, on a, a certain uh, time, timer. They would rotate. One day he put in all the plants, thousands of dollars, came back the next day, all the plants were gone, the whole shopping center, all of them. He's like, how did that happen? We have security cameras. What they found out was the criminals studied the trajectory of the cameras moving inside those domes, figured out how they moved, positioned their trucks to bypass the motor activity, and pulled all the plants out in between the movements of the cameras. This is crafty. Crafty. My dad would always come from home from work after arresting drug dealer types and people smuggling stuff in the United States. And he would say, if they would just take their brains and apply it to good things, great things would happen. I got to share, get it off my chest. And it's true. They invent evil things and they're disobedient to parents above all. Because as I've told my kids, if you will disobey your mom, you'll disobey a police officer. You'll disobey a, you'll disobey a judge. You'll disobey anybody. Disobedience to parents. Paul says, let me mention five things that top off the list. They're undiscerning. They can't tell the difference between right and wrong. They're untrustworthy. You, you can't trust them for anything. They're unloving, they're unforgiving, and they're unmerciful. And do they turn to God? No. What do they do in verse 32? Paul says, somebody that's on the sandbar of sin, they know the ordinance of God, 
and that those who practice things are worthy of death, they do not only the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Remember what I tell you? What do they do on the sandbar? I'm stuck in this, and I'm going to make sure there's as many people possible in my world that are stuck in the same sandbar. They approve of those who are on the sandbar with them. What's the solution to somebody stuck on that sandbar? Here's another vice list from a Timothy 3, or T Titus 3. Notice what Paul says. For we also were foolish ourselves, were we not, when we didn't know Christ? We were disobedient, we were deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. Paul says, hey, I used to kill Christians. I understand all that. Notice the contrast of word but. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he did what? Saved, Saved us. Who died this week? Billy, Billy Graham died this week, didn't he? He died this week. Uh, my parents used to take us to Billy Graham crusades as a kid. They wanted us to be part of that. They wanted us to bring our friends to go hear Billy speak. It was a simple, direct message, wasn't it not? You're a sinner, basically on the sandbar of sin, and you need the Savior. And I sat in those things and watched people come by the thousands to say, I need Christ. But before Billy would speak, there was an old man that would grab a microphone. And his name was uh, George Beverly Shea. And I remember in my uh, teenage years listening to George Beverly Shea, one guy, one microphone, sing. You could hear a pin drop, and then Billy would come and speak. One day he sang this with his deep baritone voice. Could we with the ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made where every stock on earth was a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry? Nor, nor could a scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. You can't even measure God's love. What's that song conclude? Oh, the love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless, how strong. It shall forevermore endure. It's the saints and the angels' song. Is that a song you can sing? Because when you're stuck on the sandbar of sin, what's God saying to you? Well, I love you, but you've got to turn to me. He specializes in taking those sinners in wealth given them life and forgiveness. That's what Billy preached. Now we look for the, the next person to step into those shoes that can be you wherever God placed you to same simple gospel message to call sinners to, to repent and God cleanses and saves. Let's pray. Father God, we pray for those in our church who don't know you. Might they talk to a counselor after church up at the front and say, I'm on that sandbar. I need to be saved. How easy it is to save a person based on that simple act of faith. And we pray that we may, might be great witnesses for you in our said culture that's lost in a quagmire of sin, cannot discern good and evil. Might we be able to speak love and truth into their lives and might they listen to turn to you in Christ's name, amen.